Good day. Today I'll be sitting down talking to Mark Basaraj as he shares more about his family's story and explains how important it has been from the recover the story of his ancestors that had been lost and how it brought a new appreciation for his own history of the 11 generations before him and how it helped to shape his understanding of his Acadian culture as a distinct ethnic group separated by its origins, values, and purpose from the French Canadian culture of Quebec. This was recorded on a frosty February morning in PEI when temperatures were at minus 40 with the wind chill. So grab a cup of hot coffee or hot chocolate and join me. So we're back today. I'm talking to Mark Basterach. The, the last time um, we were talking, I think we, we left your, um, I forget how many great back pier he had escaped from captivity in the United States. Um, it's from South Carolina. He traveled back up to, on foot to Canada and was able to get reunited with his uh, wife and, and son. Mark, yeah, just, if you want to just kind of update us where we were in the story and what we, um, what, what transpired in your family since then. And maybe we, uh, when we're talking about it, we can talk about how it relates to some of the, the events in, in Acadian history. Yeah. Well, just, I guess to summarize what we talked about last time was what uh, some people have called the, 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 the Odyssey de Bastarache. So it's the Bastarache Odyssey. So it's how um, basically these two brothers um, made it through the deportation years and, and their family survived. So, um, and that involved uh, the, the prison ship in the South Carolina, like you mentioned, and being imprisoned on the shores of Lake Ontario. But um, So the two brothers did end up settling in what is now New Brunswick in the Tracadie and Bucktush areas. Uh, and that began... That began the, the, what would be called the post-exile years. So after the peace of 1763 between the British and the French, um, it was allowed by the Nova Scotia government and the British powers that, uh, that Acadians would be allowed to, re to resettle. Um, it was a uh, programmed resettlement, so they were to be not settled on any arable land, so they were only given non-arable lands. They weren't allowed to own the land um, at that point. Um, they weren't supposed to settle in any groups more than 10 families or more than 1,000 individuals. Um, and the idea, of course, was so that the ideology could not con you know, get, get back together, so that the Acadians couldn't, couldn't assemble in, in big masses. Um, so in those post-exile years, starting in 1763, 1764, at the end of the Seven Years' War, um, it wouldn't be... It would probably be another 20 or 30 years before things were really settled because what 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 happened was is uh as acadians came out of exile returned from deportation a lot of them chose different areas largely in new brunswick there was a large a large population that, that resettled in the southeast part of new brunswick of course um, which are still there but what happened was is they would show up they would start trying to put roots down but then um, British loyalists or planters or, or British citizens would come in and kind of make them move again. So there was a few years there where there was uh, some sporadic settlements. But the eventual uh, uh, things that, that congealed into what we know now as the regions did happen there. During those years, they kind of had to re, I guess, redefine what it meant to be Acadian. Um, because up until that point, being Acadian meant you were from Acadia. You were here. It's you lived here. You lived the Acadian way, which, from what I can gather, really boils down to a few basic things, which is being non having nothing to do with the monarch. So, the British crown or the French crown doesn't really matter to you. You live in Acadia. Um, you sense that you are in a neutral position, and you're okay with doing commerce and doing anything with just about. The people that are in the area so the Acadian identity before deportation you know they were an agrarian population um, they did settle in little hamlets little villages but they didn't have a necessarily a, a cohesive political structure there was definitely um, 
structure within society, but it wouldn't be what you call a regular government. Um, but then, of course, after the deportation, these things change. So after the exile years, those years, I would say, are years of question, where they're just surviving, trying to get from one generation to the next. Um, but in the years of 1780s, especially 1790s, then you'll start seeing the big settlements happening. And that's when you see this, um, the post-deportation Acadian identity forming. Um, again, like prior, uh, largely attached to location. Um, I, I believe more attached now to, to faith than before. Um, I think pre-deportation Acadians definitely were attached to the Roman Catholicism, for sure. But that might not have been so much of their choice as what they were told to do. Because um, there was plenty of times when there was no... There was no immediate priest in the area, and the Acadian families kept on doing their things. Um, they did family baptisms, and they waited to be to be made official when the priest would show up again. But um, in the post-exile years, I think the Catholic Church saw an opportunity in a uh, displaced population, and they saw something they could grab a hold of, too. It's, it's kind of a good thing for the Church to do. Um, so the Catholic Church plays a big role in the post-deportation years, in the post-exile years, in, in Acadian identity. Um, you end up with these isolated pockets of uh, Acadian settlements, which now become regions. Um, what's neat there is you find the language reflects that. You'll hear uh, the French dialects, all, especially in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and on PEI here. Um, each region has a pretty distinct dialect of French. So those because they evolved separately from 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 the that those post-exile times um so yeah so i mean we're moving into the 1790s here where uh what it means to be acadian is a little bit different now we're little small farms people are fishermen but they're 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 still into that little quiet subdued uh, pockets of regional areas that's about it um how does that relate to my family directly well Mine is just one of the hundreds and hundreds of stories that, that yeah. pops up. It's the same. It's every everybody that can trace their, their ancestry to this story has a, it's like they got their own page in the same book. Yeah. And that that is the, the fascinating thing about family history that you can take that page that is your family and you can put it in that, that bigger picture and really see where yeah. they kind of fit in. Um it makes you appreciate the history more too when you realize that this person, not so many generations be, be, before me, um, you know, had to go through these struggles or this is the life that they found themselves in. Sure. And that's only following that one name. So that's like in my example, that's the Bastard yeah. name. Well, my mother's maiden name is Terrio. Uh, there's LeBlanc. There's uh, Cormier. Um, so if I go back to the one surviving ancestor on the Bastard line, that goes back, what, one, two, three, four seven generations but you can do the same seven generations to the same family on the other side plus it just goes back and branches off so at this point you know i don't know how many thousands thousands of plus people had to go through that journey which is the book um to end up with my page yeah, yeah. you know it's we just follow the one name because it's the easiest line to follow but the stories are just as amazing, no matter which family you follow. That's what I find fascinating with the Acadian story. Is it's it's close because it's it's my story, my personal story. But it's close in geography too. Like we are in the place that it happened. We all are. It's where it's the Maritimes. Yeah. <laughs> it's the the, the pre Canada. <clears throat> and it um. It's also a story that, ironically, for a population who's known to be. Uh, not uh, they, they didn't write things down. There's so much written about the Acadian story Because it was written by the British or the French or the New England population or all the observers It's been written by priests. It's been written by travelers um, There's so much that's written down about our story um, That's what I find fascinating and that's you know for anybody that wants to dig in and I think you started this conversation off by asking one of those questions like what do you do if you want to dig in how do you what do you do? Just ask questions. Yeah. Keep asking questions. Dig in deeper and deeper because I promise you, if you're digging down the Acadian path, 
there's a lot still to find. So the, the Acadians themselves were had a, a rich oral history more than written until, yeah. and did that change with the post-exile? Absolutely. There was a lot more written post-exile, for sure. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, the the, Brit the birth of British North America. Yeah. Um, we're getting into post-industrialization here. The Industrial Revolution is happening in the late 1790s. Um, so books, publication, it's transportation. It's, we're being a much, much more uh, global place than we were before. Who you knows, it was pretty, pretty, pretty global ahead of time before that. You know, people were traveling all over the place. But, um, no, you know, definitely pre-deportation, there was not a lot written by Acadians themselves. Uh, priests tended to be the ones that were writing things down, travelers, people coming through, um, merchants, uh, but not much, I'm not, that I, I'm not, honestly, pers personally, I don't know of anything yeah. that has survived written by Acadians. Now that kind of, to me, that raises a small question, because I can't escape the fact that the Acadians in the Mi'kmaq, one the Acadians would not have been able to exist in the first place without Mi'kmaq. Mi'kmaq, it's what's Acadia, Acadie, was built on the back of Mi'kmaq. There's just no way around that. Um, we say today that we are on unceded land of the Mi'kmaq territory. Well, that's, that's, this is a continuity of the same story. <clears throat> but the Mi'kmaq didn't write things down either. So they're, they're a, a verbal storytelling people, with oral history people. And I often wonder if the Acadians being a little bit frugal and a little adaptive as the way they were, you know, they, they liked to build houses, they had windmills, they had sawmills, there was forges, they built dikes to hold back the Bay of Fundy tides, which are, you know, the highest in the world. So these weren't people that were just kind of just sloughing it out through the woods. Like, they had stuff figured out. But they also chose not to write things down. I think that if they wanted to, they could have. You know, we, these are in the times in the 1720s. This is when uh, calculus was invented, you know. The telescope had already been invented for decades here at this point. Like, uh, European trade was happening. We know our, uh, Acadian archaeological sites, we find pottery from Europe. We find beads from Turkey. and it's So, like I said, the global, this was a global world centuries and centuries ago, before steam, before all of this. So I think that if the Acadians wanted to make paper, if they could keep back the tides of the Bay of Fundy, I think they could have made paper if they wanted to. They made their own looms. They made their own fabric. I almost believe, and this is my opinion only, but I almost wonder if it wasn't by choice. If the, the, the value of a oral history and oral stories is a little bit more organic, can be passed from one person to the next, the lessons are deep and intertwined, um, as opposed to what happens to stories when you write them down. When you write down a story and you put it in a book, well, the book can then be used as a power tool. You know, you have to follow the book, right? I'm using the analogy for a reason, right? The book. Um, if you don't follow the rules in the book, well, then, then we can, you know, you can, you can own a story if you have it published. You can own the narrative. I mean, look what Henry Wadsworth Longfellow did. He wrote a book. Yeah. Kind of own the Acadian story a little bit. He was a New Englander that had never been here. But, um, so I kind of wonder if the Acadians being storytellers, musicians, and all of the ways that they tell stories isn't a spin-off of the Mi'kmaq way of oral tradition. And, and I wonder if it's, it sounds like they might just been too busy to <laughs> write things down. Too busy, uh, you know, but there's also accounts of some, some uh, British observers in the early days of early Acadia where they called the Acadians lazy. Yeah. Because they saw, they said all they did to sit around and do nothing. Um, and the reason they said that is they, they were comparing it to the farmers of New England or back in Britain, because uh, the Acadians' bounty were the, the crops were so bountiful on the on the dykeland farming that they didn't have to work real hard. Their yield per acre was ten times what it was in New England. Um, so that was just a joke on them being lazy, but they were just kind of smarter at that point. Um, work smarter, not harder, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, now I wonder if, um, 
yeah, I think if they had wanted to write things down, I think they could have. I think they would have. Um, you know, they are familiar with it. The church registers are full of Acadian signatures. Mm -hmm. Some people would sign their name. They were literate enough to sign their, 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 their own name. Some would write with an X. Yeah. But the church registers have survived from a lot of the parishes prior to the de de deportation. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I see it on the wall. I don't know if we can see it on the camera here, but, you know, the Acadians, we do our lineage. We say, well, I'm, I'm, she, she, people will say, you know, well, who's your father here on PEI, right? It's all about that genealogical line. Yeah. Um, you know, we're here to talk about genealogy. Uh, but I almost wonder if one of the reasons why the Acadians do this and they hold on to that so strong is it's another part of these these oral traditions. It's telling your family story just in a straight line. Yeah. That says which mark I am, which fast rash line I am. Oh, I'm one of these. Yeah, that's the line. And it tells the story because we all know where we came from. The long story is known, but we don't have to write it on our arms. We don't tattoo it. We don't carry it on our faces, but we tell it in our in our in our names. See, um, Yeah. So, it's. Uh, I think I think we're an oral story for a reason. And I, I think a lot of. I I want to say, the. The non nobility class. It was, oral story tradition whether it's Acadian um, you know the Scottish the Irish sure it's um, you know they told it through song they told their history yeah. through song and uh, um, is now you're talking about writing in the church registers now being a mercantile and a trading people um, other records out there um, that would have been kept by these traders or these merchants and Again, I've not seen anything that was directly written by Acadians other than their names and, and pen marks in church registers. Um, it's not something I've specifically looked for, but I've definitely not come across it. Um, but there's plenty of, of discussion of the Acadians trading with the French or the British or whoever's coming through. They, were, they, they lived at ports on rivers, and if they had excess, they would trade with whoever. You know, they supplied Lewisburg, so I'm sure there's got to be some some mark on the French side of things. Um, but I know nothing of any actual documentation left behind by the Acadians. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, the, you're right, like that's the one thing that I think a lot of people know about Acadian cultures. They know it has this rich heritage of <laughs> storytelling and song, and with that... Um, with with those families post post exile when did the things start to change and how what are some of the the earliest writings that you would say by acadians that tell an acadian story and were they just the retelling of some of these oral stories or are they telling new stories that it there was a period post exile um especially around the turn of the century, the, around the end of the 18th century into the 19th century, where some historians um, of Acadian descent um, were interested in, in talking to some of the old survivors of the deportation. So there are some first-hand interview accounts that were done in the early, early 1800s. Um, the names escape me right now. I know some of the older, older people, there was a Placid, uh, Placid Dada that did some stuff. He, he did a lot of interviews, but I can't remember the years. Um, a lot of these people came from the clergy. They're still clergymen. That, that were, they're the literate ones. They're the ones that started the first schools. So the first schools in the Acadian region, were, of course, were associated with the church. So I think literacy really started beginning from the top down there. So with that, even like the, the telling of your own story, <clears throat> how much of that had you been told and how much had you had the research like well, this? see there. Do you, uh, like, did you start 
And did, did you know some of this stuff before you really started to dig into it, or no? So it was lost at some point. It was lost. It it broke. It got broke for before it got to me. Yeah. Um, Would that be common? Do you find with the, the like a lot a lot of the, if I was to talk to somebody that's Acadian today, would they not necessarily be able to tell specific stories about their ancestors? They, yeah. they might know the general broad history. I think sure. I think I think you're right. I think the the vast majority would not know the long story. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I had to dig mine up. Um, for years, I always wondered what my name meant. Yeah. You know, uh, it stands out amongst the crowd. Bastard Ash. It's not. It's not a what you quote unquote normal last name. I, mean, I don't know what a normal last name is, but, um. You know, I grew up in an Acadian community in, in Clare, in Southwest Nova Scotia. But it stood out there too. It was different than all the Terrios and Sonias and Comos and Ludlons and yeah. and Goda and Dusa and it was it was you know you, and then all the other Acadian regions I knew it still stood out. So all my life I kind of wondered what it meant. Yeah. Um, but then as the internet evolved, people started putting more info online, so I could find out more. Um, and that's when I just started digging in, and digging in and digging in. Um, as a if there's young Acadians that are out there, or people of Acadian that are watching this, that don't know their own particular story. Why? Why do you think it's important for them to find it? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think it's vastly important. Um, I think the Acadian story, in and of itself, without any specifics, is an interesting one in history. Mm -hmm. If you peel back the layers of the French connection, the English-British connection, and you just look at it in the lens of somehow we end up with a population that identifies as separate, as unique, and they call themselves Acadian. They're not French. They're not British. They might have signed oaths. They might have done this or that, but... They even proved at the end that it was worth fighting for. So whatever they had built in a period of about 125 to 130 years was distinct and unique enough, number one, to be deported, to, to be deported an effective genocide attempt. Mm -hmm. There was an act of resistance. Um, so there's, there's clearly some type of value there. So when I distill it down, what I see is I see a European population seed population that comes to the new world um north america turtle island <clears throat> and they themselves not directly by conquest there's not a lot of obvious clear history that i've been able to dig up or see where you find tanglings between acadians and Mi'kmaq directly um I feel like the Acadian identity is born of Mi'kma'ki. So the lesson in this is, is what I see is the importance is they also, this is the integration of a native population and a, and a displaced European population. But like I said, not through conquest. It's not through war. It's not through coercion. There's, it's, there's, there's no thievery going on. <clears throat> Even to so as far as the Acadians tended to be dike land farmers. So they reclaimed the ocean bottom from the Bay of Fundy as opposed to cutting down the forests. So this kind of it leaves nature a little bit alone. Um, you know, you're taking from the ocean. Well, that seems like a pretty powerful thing to do. Um, so I see a little bit of a synergistic relationship between the peoples... First Nations, and then this European population, and the land, where the rhythm becomes that of, of synergy with the tide. Um, so I, I really see this, this really interesting thing. They don't, you know, once the Acadian identity really starts forming, they're kind of disconnected from Europe. They're, they can't, like their ancestors came from there, sure. But they're not dependent on European trade, they're not dependent on taxation, they're not getting money, they're not... You know, they're not on the dole. 
They don't, they don't need food supplies being brought over from Europe. They're largely just created a new people. Um, so to be part of that story is important, I think. I think it's an important thing to look into. Um, I'm a dreamer, and I'm a little bit of a storyteller, so I see these in a kind of a romantic way. But then I also look at the world history since then, and whether or not I'm accurate or not, I think there's lessons that can be learned from the ideology anyhow. Because, you know, a lot of times, all of the other countries that I can think of, and these borders and the fighting that we do today, when I look at the Acadian history and the original story, the way I like to tell it, I see a little bit of a different way. There could have been a different way. And, you know, if you can trace your ancestry back to that story, look into it. There's lessons to learn. There's lessons to learn. There's lessons to learn because there was value there, and that value was valuable enough to, to be silenced. It, yeah, it sounds like they were able to eke a peaceful coexistence, which, you know, and probably a codependency as well. Completely. Trade and... I mean, there was intermarriage. There was, you know, family relations was all what happened. There was, you know, there was a new rhythm that was set on the shores of this side of the Atlantic with the creation of the, the Acadian people and how they interacted with the Mi'kmaq and the Mi'kmaq, with the land of, of the Mi'kmaq. Um, had that been left to its own devices, I don't know what would have happened, but it would have been definitely interesting to see. Um, it's a... Uh, yeah, it's a, just an interesting way of looking at an alternative. Yeah, because it's even, I mean, knowing the nature of Canada is, is today, the French people that are Acadian, they're much different than the, the Quebecois. They, they're, they're, <laughs> their language is different. Like, it's, it, it's, it's because they're different. That's why. Yeah. That's why. It's because they are different. Um, absolutely. You know, they speak French in Belgium, too. Yeah. They're very different than every other pick a category, right? Um, and that's the whole point of this is, is uh, there's a lot of reason for the power structure, especially back in the day being, you know, the Br British power, um, to categorize every French speaking person under the French flag, because then you can, you can deal with them. They're part of the enemy. Yep. Oh, look at that. It's another French Catholic. Off they go. Um, there's no reason to believe that that's ever really changed and stopped. You know, we like to categorize things by things that make sense to us. And that word French, you can put a lot under that umbrella. But um, what I like to try to do is just separate the, the conversation and say, yeah, no, wait a second. There's this other thing called Acadians. And yeah, they spoke French, but they probably spoke English too. And they probably spoke Mi'kmaq. So what were they? They were Acadian. Yeah. It's straight up, you know. This, this place arguably existed for 130 years um, in its heyday. Uh, you know, that's almost as long as we've had Canada. Yeah. So what forms in 130 years of, of an existence? Pretty unique identity, I think, you know? And with that unique identity, would there be a, a common region where the people from Acadia would have come from in France originally, or some areas that are more common that, that that's why these particular people, they grouped together when they were over here. Mm. The way I, I wonder, the way I think of that question when people ask that is, how would I ask, how would you answer it if I was to ask, you know, what, what's, where's the typical origin of a Canadian family? Yeah. There is none. So the Acadian story, and this is my point, is, yeah, there's a bunch of orig originating families that came from a general area, sure. But that immediately changed on the second generation. Yeah. Now your entire second generation are natural-born Acadians. So where those original families came from is it really irrelevant because they were French. Yeah, um, yeah, they came from the Poitou region. There was, you know, southwest France. There was, there was a big chunk there of the first group that came over by design. Um, but what I assert that becomes the Acadian identity in the end are the second, third, fourth generations. The ones that choose to stay, the ones that fight for their land, the ones that have values built in here. Um, there's some of the original 
generations of Acadians, if you recall, um, some were from Britain. My ancestors are from the Basque region. There are some from Portugal. Um, so it's not necessarily directly from France. Yeah. They were, like you said, uh, uh, they were like much like Canada is today, a multicultural that yeah. it might have been predominantly French, but they were, they kind of, um, yeah, got together. Yeah, like Port Royal at the time was the, one of the busiest ports on the eastern seaboard between Boston and New York, um, which is now Annapolis, of course. Um, it was a busy spot. People coming and going from everywhere. Um, so who stayed? Who who went? Who had babies? You know, it's uh, it it becomes a um, it becomes a more of a of a gray area and a complicated story because we really like to try to simplify these things in single sentences. You know, the Acadians are the descendants of French settlers. Boom, end of story. Well, no, that's not the end of the story. It's actually way more complicated than that. You know, so. Um, one of the things, and you brought up a little, but just knowing the history of Nova Scotia, when we we talk about different people's groups that that came there, um, there were French settlers that the British allowed in. In fact, they invited them. The um, the French settlers from Swi Switzerland yeah. that they and that settled on the South Shore uh, along with Swiss Germans and. Um, but the differentiating thing was, it wasn't so much that they were French that the the English had an issue with it was that they were Catholic, they weren't um, Protestant. Um, so how much you talked a little bit about it? How much of an influence has that Catholicism been on the actual development of uh, <coughs> the Acadian culture today? What it is. Um, partially, they, they were the record keepers. They were the, the ones who were the educated, like, um, most early education institution. Um, North America, they were set up by one religious group or another mm. um, with the premise to educate clergy, but educate the population as well. Um, so how much influence did that have and um and what kind of influence does that still play today within yeah well the catholic church has had a, a hand on the acadians pretty much from the beginning even though some of the originating families were huguenots they were they, they were protestant mm -hmm. um but especially post deportation and those exile years um you know, I, I do believe that the, I do think that the Acadians, by and large, like many people, are people of faith. Um, how much they're active practicing and how tenacious they are to actual religions kind of waxes and wanes over time, probably. Um, I can imagine surviving those 11 years of troubles and then the post-exile period, um, having something to hold on to and having a belief structure is probably almost a survival tactic yeah i was gonna say almost you, you need faith Jeez, in those, yeah cause... yeah so you know so of course <laughs> this is going back so i wasn't there but um <laughs> how how tenacious the acadians were to their really religiosity before deportation i'm not sure i'm quite i question it a little bit um but after this, these exile years you do see a huge huge, huge, huge gravity towards the church. Um, there's a lot of information out there, again, that's written down <clears throat> about how the church actively sought after these Acadian populations in the regions. And, and uh, I mean, the Catholic Church is pretty known to to want to sell their message. You know, they've been doing it for thousands of years. <laughs> um, they're pretty good at that, their marketing program as well. Um, There was a lot of discussion about symbology um, after deportation into the uh, is there into the 1860s, 70s. So again, this is after Canada's Canada, okay? So right about the time of Confederation, um, Acadian groups are trying to start to figure out, okay, how are we going to identify ourselves? 
So today, if you drive around any Acadian region, you'll see the flag, the, uh, the red, white, blue with the yellow star. Um, of course, it's right off of the, the tricolor from France, um, and there's a reason for that. But it took years and years and years of discussion through the church, through community groups. There was pros and cons, and there was arguments, and there's some nefarious activity that, that, that's been involved with the, the three uh, national Acadian conferences that happened, um, that culminated in the one in the Scush uh, PEI in 1884, which settled on um, the major tenets of Acadian symbology. So the flag, the national anthem, um, the religious dates, the dates of celebration, what saints to celebrate and what not to, that all had to be decided. Um, that was all decided at, at, really at church conventions. Um, so, and there was also counter-arguments to a lot of these things. Like, there was one case where the uh, the pro voice for the, the current flag and the Ave Mari Stella and, and then the, the symbols that, that we know today, um, they kind of, uh, they set the deck against their opposition. They made sure that they weren't able to show up at one of the conventions where some voting was happening. So the people that voted only had one option to vote. Um, and uh, they came prepared, and they didn't tell the other people to come prepared. It was, it was a little bit of some some underground things. But that's how we ended up with uh, today's Acadian flag. Yeah, which is interesting because at the time, the Acadians um, would have identified as being French or from France. Those are, that wasn't the flag that... No, well, see, in a way, what they did is they took, see, the French, the, the, the tricolor, the, the tricolor flag, that's the uh, the revolutionary flag yeah. of France. And they wanted to bastardize it by throwing the star on it. So in a way, it, it is kind of like a little, in a way, not necessarily showing the, the happiness to the French flag, but they wanted to, to desecrate it a little, a little bit. Um, that's one of the, the conversations that you read in some of these papers when you, when you read some of the... The, the digging up of the old stuff, um, but it's uh, it's 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 an interesting discussion because you realize that these symbols were were largely chosen by the church. Hey, I'm Brian Nash, and if you're new here, you might recognize me from my avatar beside my channel name. I just wanted to stop you here to thank you for making it this far. If you think more people's family stories need to be told, consider subscribing to my channel and hit the notification bell so you'll get a notification of my next video. Okay, I took enough of your time, so let's get back to Mark's story, and, but I want you to stick around to the end, and I'll help you learn how to find and organize the information you need to be able to know your own family story. And I apologize, something happened to one of my mics in this last section, so it's not as high quality as you deserve. I didn't cut it out, though, because it's important to hear the full story. Would you say church, in a way, set the stage or set the definition of what an Acadian is to be able to talk about, that before we start recording, you know, you don't have an old French accent, so if you were talking, they might not necessarily recognize you as Acadian uh, at first, um, and, you know, even Acadian people, even if people might have a, a deeper able to prove your connection. That it's not, it's not right. Well, I guess I try to summarize it. I guess so. We got to decide who gets, not who, but how do you inform what is your community? So, like you just said, I, I don't have a French accent, okay, so that must be so this French accent you can give you and it does. Um, so, you know, my name doesn't look like it's so I feel weird as a But, you know, I go back. Ten on the other side, with zero brains. My family was not directly deported. They spent time as, re as refugees here. Um, none of the ancestors left. I was born on in this territory. So I was born in this country. My first ancestor was one of the last generation shows up. So, effectively, I've never thought, like, I'm, I'm 
is still disconnected while you return that thing. But because the Acadian identity seems to be only by the group the population of that it doesn't mean anything. Because if I don't sound French and don't look French and don't look Acadian, then you know all of a sudden you gotta start explaining the story. The actual part of the truth of the story is I go back to my generations. On this brand new, on this unseen big my territory, it used to be called the Canadian. So, I don't know. Um, I can see it's, it's strange. And it's got to be because people are Especially when you start studying you know, the family tree, you tend to identify. Past, no matter what that is, but you find out that your particular family were Scottish Highlanders, so they're part of the, the clearances from Scotland and start to, to develop that. And then, you know, no matter, you might not have a map going back a couple generations, you know, before you can find one of those, you, you, you have that feeling when you start to identify, you, you start to, I guess, relate. Understanding the family tradition or the family, you can look back at the names and you're like, oh, that's why we have so many people with this name in here. My like, man, that you know, I can go back to my second great grandfather. He was better than me. There's like seven other people with this, almost the same name. Um, yeah. The the um, being Catholic, there's a stereotype of large Catholic families. Sure. I think we're particularly probably up to the mid 20th century, we're more popular than that. We get that in um, Catholic populations, Irish, French, whatever. Um, I think that that was a really in, the, in almost Hindsight for the British part of the the numbers, they didn't really account for it. One of these large families, you know, you have, you have 10 families, 1,000 people. Yeah. It depends what you call a family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's been plenty of written about that. Like in the early, we alluded to this earlier about um, how the early Canadian settlements with Dagenheim farming and how their crop fields were really, really good. So you, you don't have to work really hard to get high quality crop, you can raise a lot of livestock, you can feed yourself, you can raise wages, yeah. healthy moms, healthy families, healthy babies. So, direct comparison, in the heyday of the uh, Canadian agriculture and, and sustainable farming here, um, in comparison to the their uh, birth rates and survival rates were like three to four times old. So they had a lot of people with their families who were together. Um, I don't know how related that was to Catholicism or not. Um, I think it has more to do with a really healthy, growing yeah. population on a tidal river uh, with abundance of food, limited. Like, you're not in a war torn country. Like I said, that's why this is an important story. Um, these people are just interacting with land. It's not, they're not taking over a burnt or scorched earth place and nothing like that. So they really had a period of abundance. And they named their, their communities like accordingly. Like um, at, at the top end of the river of Annapolis, which they called the Dauphin River back then, um, the first French speaking Canadian settler was called the Tadabi Pets, Earthly Paradise. And it really was. I mean, if you go there today, you can close your eyes and imagine. You just blink once or twice and delete modern structures. It's the same vista, it's the same really flat, slow valley between the soft mountains. Um, you get this meandering old, old river which is just snaked up through the valley. You can imagine it's like a little bit of a really a point. Maybe with the low. Mortality rate, your population is going to oh. grow. 
Yes. And then, you know, you, people would get married young. They, they had babies young, but just the all church registry still survived. So we know people mostly got married in the early 20s. And they have babies like nine months later. But it's, it's happening because the birth, birth the, the baptismal records follow the marriage records pretty cleanly. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of survival. And there was also room to grow. So they had technology, they had bike net farming. So when one area, little area around the river system got a little overpopulated or a little bit too tight, they just moved to another river system. They didn't have any roads, they didn't have trees. These were sea barriers. So they would go by small shallow or, or, or small sailboats or their ocean water. We talked a, a lot about Nova Scotia Acadians and really the peninsula of Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia was was much more than what we call Bay Dolphin. And I would want to, in a way, reflects a lot of that Acadian um, culture in general. They have, they are, they have a definite they're our only bilingual college. Yeah. They're, you know, there's that yeah. that coming together, like, okay, we've got to get along with these people. Yeah. Um, you know, now, on the other side of the country, in, um, in, in what we call the front, where there are eating there, were they doing the same sort of thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it's very funny. It's very funny. Both yeah. like, so any river system that you'll find on the very funny. All the way up to St. John River Valley, down to um, the river. There was the predator in the town, but it, that was, it was a famous battle, and they, they burnt the whole village. Um, um, yep, Shepherd River, all, all those things. So, do you put what happens when you're running is to get separated from Nova Scotia. It happened twice there this point. So, um, Acadia, Acadia, or Nova Scotia, as you'll see on the later maps, originally was mainland peninsula of Nova Scotia. And what we know now is Nova Scotia, the mainland parts of you know, the time period of Um, but the, the, the western border was always kind of great. Uh, during the Seven Years' War, the pinch point at Port Postage or at, at where the border is between Nova Scotia and Plymouth right now. There was two ports that were built there. That was effectively that was kind of like the we would call it the, the no man's land there, but that was the standoff point. So there was north of that was back at the class eight, French Acadia. Yeah. South of that was back in the Agri, English, or Nova Scotia. So the north side of that remained French control for quite a bit longer. Um, that's where the refugee camps were. Um, it was, as, as the French were treated into Quebec, they were eventually lost, of course. Um, and New Brunswick Territory was still under the French. It only became New Brunswick in the 1780s, and not until 1884, I'm going to say. Um, and that happened. But no, that was that was that was um, mainland of New Brunswick. The, the hinterland was still no man's land. Um, it wasn't populated. The only around the river systems um, was population. That was still very much mainland. Um, Alongside, it, where you find rivers is where you find the Canadians. So the Canadians largely would not be land. They stayed on the river, marshy lands, and where would they have it? See, they were they were building hamlets and, and, and settlements. Big Mop were nomads. They moved in the seasons. They moved in and out of the woods as they needed to. They were short in summer, inland in the winter. Um, hunt for protein meat in the winter, seafood, shellfish in the summer. Um, games, no, they sat still. They didn't have those in shelter. So um, to do that, the only way that they could have movement and access was through water. So Odd portage in land and odd little you know paths in inland from Scotia and moving to Russia. But by and large, the Indian settlements were not not that way. Now we talked about 
talk about we talk a little bit about that
I love talking to those people in relation to my ancestors because there's so much memories that are you are you both through tastes and smell um, you know finding out that this is a you know a recipe that has been passed down for years now probably modified along mm -hmm. the way people have their own kind of stuff there's that that essence of this is this is you know something similar to my great grandparents whatever would have eaten or things that you know, I'm sure some like they had to develop while they were in these refugee camps because they you know they had to adapt um, even potatoes you know um, the land Canada much like Ireland you know there's a lot of places potatoes probably wasn't the few crops you came from unless you're down in the Appalachian Valley or and those areas but it's, it's it's readily available, so you, yeah. you, you develop dishes and you yeah. diet around it. Um, but they, it, yeah, it really gives you a much different uh, the feeling. You know, you can't live there, but maybe you can taste it a little bit. Or so if you're listening to music and you can picture your ancestors, yeah. you can think, especially your old, old house, you know, generations ago, probably somebody listened to the same tune. And yeah, exactly. Maybe they're singing different words. Some of the tunes or parts of it were yeah. um, similar. Um, yeah, there, there's the, that experiential part of uh, you know culture that kind of makes us shape us what we what we are, what we, we think that things that are in, innate to us that you never know you know where you get your appreciation from. Yeah. So, so sometimes when you start thinking, yeah, that's good. You know, even yourself, you, you work with your, your hands as uh, uh, your God signing and violins and fiddle. And, uh, when I came in here, you work on a stand up bass. Uh, you know, that I, from talking to that, would have been maybe not necessarily the artisans, it was your ancestors, would have been people that worked with their hands. And, you know, we shape and say, you know, they're, uh, they're in part of important part of yeah. Acadian culture. The, the fiddle idea, when I think of Acadian music, I think of the fiddle and the being yeah. played and the, uh, um, you know, those, those same things, yeah, for me, yeah, yeah. I should kind of wonder how much of that, how much of that is in your DNA and how much of that is, well, is experiential, because that's, you know, yeah. because it's in your parents' DNA, because that's what they listen to, because that's what their parents listen to. I know my own son, um, you know, I, I find it interesting. He likes, you know, a lot of modern music, but I often catch him listening to um, Great Big C and yeah. Stan Rogers, even, uh, you know, uh, things that I, you know, type of music that I associate um, with the style of music that would be in my, in my yeah. heritage. It kind of makes me, it makes me proud. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, rub, I rub off in a good way. Yeah. You know, it makes you wonder, like, you know, does this stuff get passed on? You know, I've always been a camper, yeah. and there's some bits of me that, and I know a lot of people, older generations, my grandparents, so years, and my father's of age, you know, all these, these people, you know, they're, they just, it amazes me what they can figure out, what they figure out. Is that something that's grew up with, or that can it be passed on? What an interesting story Mark had to tell. And it's amazing what you can find when you start building your family's history. And you can start by clicking this playlist right here. While St. Anne's Real plays us out. And remember to keep searching for your ancestors.